Welcome to another Big Train Tour at the Colorado Railroad Museum. This month, we'll be taking a look at a caboose which once served on an electrified interurban railway line operating between Denver and Golden. Today, Denver and Intermountain Caboose Number no. 902 is proudly displayed at the museum with a unique history to share. Hi, I'm Paul Hammond, Executive Director of the Colorado Railroad Museum. Our subject caboose is the only full-sized artifact at the museum built for service on an electrified railroad. Come join me now as we take a look at the history of trolleys in Denver and this full-sized reminder preserved at the Colorado Railroad Museum in Golden. Denver was established in 1858, and in its early years, the city was so small, there was no need for public transportation. That changed after 1870, when the Denver Pacific and the Kansas Pacific Railroads were completed, linking Denver with the nation's rail network. The city rapidly expanded from less than 5,000 people in 1870 to 35,000 in 1880 and a whopping 105,000 residents by 1890. With all of this growth, people needed a way to get across town. In 1871, the city's first transit company, the Denver City Railway, completed a horse-drawn route operating along tracks laid from Araria to Curtis Park. By the 1880s, 15 miles of horse-drawn streetcar tracks were in service, facilitating the city's growth to the southeast and northeast. The Denver City Railway had an exclusive franchise on the use of horse cars, but by the mid-1880s, other promising technologies led to a new company's incorporation. Known as the Denver Tramway Company, its leaders included former Colorado Governor John Evans and his son William, Rocky Mountain News owner William Byers, and local developer Henry Brown. In 1886, the company launched electric streetcars on 15th Street, but the line lasted less than a year before being removed. This early technology, which used an electrified third rail, occasionally shocked people and horses when it got wet. Cable cars, which were coming into use all across America, were next on the scene. By 1889, Denver Tramway was operating a 12-mile cable network centered on what is today Civic Center Park. The competing horse car operator quickly shifted to cable cars as well, reincorporating as the Denver City Cable Railway. The rivalry between the two largest of Denver's transit companies would lead to the development of one of the most extensive cable car networks in the country. The Denver City Cable Railway building, which still stands in downtown Denver, drove the largest cable railway system ever run from a single powerhouse. The company's Welton Street line, which stretched about seven miles, was the longest in the U.S. when it was built. Another interesting feature of the network was its use of viaducts, which allowed the cable cars to cross safely above the city's expanding network of steam railroad tracks. By the early 1890s, new electric streetcar technology using overhead wires had proven superior to cable cars. Denver Tramway in 1893 converted its major lines to the new system. That same year, the Panic of 1893 caused major financial distress nationwide, with Denver and all of Colorado very much affected. Denver Tramway would become the only major streetcar company still in business in the city, with an all-electric trolley network in place by 1900. Denver Tramway's electric streetcars provided the city's primary mass transit system for the next 50 years. Thanks to the extensive network, which spanned 155 miles by 1903, people could live miles from work and pay only a nickel to get there. Streetcars made it possible to develop neighborhoods ever farther from the city's core, such as City Park, Park Hill, Montclair, South Denver, and Berkeley. Interestingly, with just one exception, the Denver Tramway system was built to a gauge of 3 foot 6 or 42 inches the same track gauge as the earlier cable car lines. Another kind of transit provider, electric interurban railways, 
came onto the American scene in the 1890s, coincidental with the introduction of electricity to cities. The idea was to offer low-cost, frequent service between town and city centers within a defined region. Where inner-city steam railroads connected cities and interchanged freight and passenger traffic throughout the nation, interurban railways typically circulated freight and passengers within a regional group of communities or a metropolitan area. Colorado would eventually host several interurban routes, including three operating to the west of Denver. One of these, the Denver and Interurban, was incorporated by the Colorado and Southern Railway, which was looking to expand its routes and holdings around the turn of the 20th century. This standard gauge interurban route began operations between Denver and Boulder in 1908, but it was abandoned less than 20 years later in 1926. By contrast, the region's other two interurban lines would operate until 1950. Beginning in 1903, the Denver and Northwestern built 3-foot-6 gauge tracks and overhead wires from downtown Denver through Arvada to Leyden, accessing coal from the Leyden mine in which it had an ownership interest. This line, which also offered electric interurban passenger service, later became Denver Tramway Route 82. For its next step, the Denver and Northwestern extended the route from Arvada to Golden. Trolley tracks and overhead wires were installed paralleling Clear Creek. On April 9, 1904, the electric interurban line began regular trolley service to Golden. This line later became Denver Tramway Company's Route 83, running from Denver via Arvada to Golden. Rockdale was a passenger stop on this trolley line to Golden, just southwest of the Colorado Railroad Museum's current location. A shelter more than a depot, it served local farming families and city folks coming out to buy fresh local produce. The Rockdale name came from the station's proximity to a quarry on North Table Mountain that sent rock down by wagon, and later via an incline railway, to a crusher plant near the station. The plant supplied rock used for street paving and track ballast to the Denver tramway system for many years. The standard gauge Denver and Intermountain Railway was formed in 1904 from the foreclosure of the Denver, Lakewood and Golden, which in 1893 had begun passenger service to Golden with steam-powered trains. By 1909, the company had electrified the line, opening trolley service from downtown Denver through Lakewood to Golden on what became Denver Tramway Route 84. This would become the only standard gauge electric line in the extensive Denver Tramway system. If you were traveling from Denver to Golden from, say, 1910 to 1950, you might choose to ride one of these two tramway routes. Your journey would begin in downtown Denver. Depending on which route you chose, you might be riding aboard a 3-foot-6 gauge interurban electric car, and you would travel via Arvada and past rolling farmlands and a brewery en route to Golden. If you chose to take the interurban line via Lakewood to Golden, you would be traveling aboard a standard gauge interurban car through mostly open countryside. Once you reached Golden, you might step off the car at one of the stops along downtown streets or perhaps ride all the way to the Grand Brick Interurban Depot. Opened in 1905, this fine structure was located right in the heart of Golden, on 13th between Washington and Arapahoe streets. Serving interurban cars of both track gauges, this was the only brick passenger depot in Golden. All other depots serving steam railroad lines were built of wood. Freight traffic was a typical component of many electric interurban railroads. As a result, these companies often were competitors with steam railroads. Both interurban railroads to Golden would include freight traffic as part of their business mix. The three-foot six gauge route to Arvada and Leyden had actually been established with the primary purpose of hauling freight, and specifically, coal. Denver Tramway generated its own electricity in downtown Denver by burning coal from the Leyden mine. The old powerhouse still stands today, a large brick building found on the banks of the Platte River occupied by recreational gear supplier REI. Unrelated to Denver Tramway's own coal needs, the upper portion of the line between Arvada and Leyden was dual-gauged early on to supply coal to the Denver and Salt Lake Railroad. 
The balance of the line was dual gauged in 1913 to facilitate mine access from the Colorado and Southern Railway, which connected at Arvada. This allowed standard gauge freight cars from both steam railroads to be brought to the mines for loading, hauled behind three foot six gauge electric freight locomotives. Freight service along the standard gauge interurban route to Golden dates from the early 1890s. In 1893, when the line was new, a branch line was established off the main line heading south to the town of Barnum, which had been established by the famed circus showman. The very next year, a short-lived branch was established between Golden and the company town of Tyndale to the north, with coal mines and a brickworks being the main industries served. The Denver and Northwestern had been established as a separate corporation, but it quickly purchased the Denver Tramway Company itself. So, in essence, this was a subsidiary company from the beginning. Denver Tramway acquired the standard gauge interurban route to Golden in 1910. The Tramway Company quickly established a wholly owned subsidiary, the Denver and Intermountain, to operate all freight services on its lines after 1912. Photographs of the freight operations typically show the locomotives, cabooses, and other equipment lettered for this company in later years, rather than for Denver Tramway or Denver and Northwestern. A year after the standard gauge main line to Golden was electrified, two additional freight branches were constructed. One headed south towards Morrison paralleling today's Interstate 470 and serving two clay mines. The other, a much shorter spur line paralleling Clear Creek and Golden, served the ruby clay mines at the western edge of the city. For several decades, this mine would account for a majority of freight traffic on the interurban route to Golden. Another spur off this line served a lumber yard in Golden as well. In 1917, as the United States was entering World War I, the Denver and Intermountain teamed up with the Great Western Sugar Company. The goal was to convince Lakewood farmers to plant sugar beets, since sugar refining capacity had been expanded throughout Colorado and Wyoming. As enticement, if at least 500 acres were planted, an automatic shovel dump, a specialized loading facility for the beets, was promised to be built. The scheme worked, and over 2,000 acres were actually planted. The loading facility existed for many years at Garrison Street alongside the interurban tracks. All of this activity kept the Denver and Intermountains freight service booming. In 1924, the company decided it needed a new standard gauge caboose, so one was built in the Denver Tramway's own shops. It was a simple wood-bodied car with a sliding door for smaller, less than carload commodities and package freight. Numbered 902, it featured a steel frame and rode on second-hand trucks of Union Pacific Railroad heritage. Thankfully, it was much more typical than an earlier caboose also built by Denver Tramway for the three-foot six-gauge lines. The caboose, interestingly, also featured a whistle atop its cupola for use during backup moves. When the federal government first situated a munitions plant at what is today the Denver Federal Center in 1940 and 1941, freight service was extended to the new plant under an agreement with the major steam railroads in the region. After the war, as the facility was converted to use by various federal agencies, freight service remained important. It was served first by steam locomotives and later diesel electrics hailing from the various railroads in the region. Sometimes these would be equipped with trolley poles to activate grade crossings along the line. Of course, the growth of paved highways and the interstate highway network would eventually catch up with railroads and rail transit systems after World War II. The situation was no different in the Denver region, and as suburban growth intensified, agricultural freight traffic and ridership aboard streetcars also declined. Denver Tramway ended all passenger rail operations on July 2, 1950, replacing them with rubber-tired buses. Interurban service to Golden on both routes came to a close as a result. Coal was no longer needed for the tramway's powerhouse, so the line to Leyden was also abandoned. 
Freight service was abandoned to Golden on the standard gauge route just three years later. Traffic had been declining anyway, and rubber tired trucks could handle most of the remaining traffic. Caboose 902 would be sold off to a scrapyard in the Denver area. Luckily, the owner retained the car rather than actually dismantling it for scrap. Some 20 years later, the Colorado Railroad Museum purchased the car from the scrapper and it was moved to the museum in Golden in 1973. It has been displayed here ever since and been repainted and re-lettered several times over the years. Denver Federal Center became the final customer on the remaining portion of the former Standard Gauge Interurban Line from Denver, long after passenger service was abandoned and the line de-electrified. Eventually, this service too came to an end, and the line's remnants went into what seemed like a suspended state with the right-of-way remaining intact to Federal Center. The status quo continued until the city and county of Denver took over transit operations from the private Denver Tramway. The new Regional Transportation District, formed in 1969, assumed operation of Denver's bus system in 1974. Trolley rails returned to the Denver area in 1994 with the opening of RTD's first light rail segment in central Denver. While the original Route 83 and Route 84 interurban tracks are long gone into Golden, and while much of the Route 83 line is today obliterated by Highway 58, RTD's W line offers light rail service to the Jefferson County Government Center, not far from downtown Golden. The W line follows the original standard gauge interurban alignment for much of its route between Denver and Federal Center. The very last completely intact electric interurban passenger car that once served the Denver area also survives to this day. Built by Denver's own Weber Carriage Company and placed into service in 1911, car number 25 was purchased by the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club after the abandonment of passenger service. Displayed for many years at the Colorado Railroad Museum, it is currently stored at the Denver Federal Center with limited public access. Thanks for joining me today. Denver and Intermountain Caboose number 902 is a physical reminder of the once extensive Denver Tramway trolley network that blanketed Denver and extended west to Golden. In preserving this caboose, the Colorado Railroad Museum looks to share the ever-evolving story of public transportation and, in this case, how it once coexisted with freight trains as well. I hope you've enjoyed learning about this former electric railway caboose, and I also hope that your appreciation for Colorado's rich railroad heritage continues to grow with each and every tour of the museum's collections. Like, comment, share, and subscribe. Commenting and sharing in particular may qualify as virtual engagements for important funding programs like the SCFD.